Hey, how come you don't make videos using your degree? Uh, why are diamonds so expensive? Um, it's because of De Beers, see? Because De Beers have a monopoly on diamond mines, and that makes them- Oh my god, shut up! It's not De Beers! <laughs> Let's start with some lore. For centuries, the only two nations producing diamonds were India and Brazil, and they were so rare the idea of diamonds being sold to the public was unthinkable. That all changed in 1866 when a diamond was found around Orange River in South Africa. This massively increased the supply of diamonds and diamond miners. According to basic economic theory, this surge in diamonds should have reduced the prices of diamonds because they were oversupplied. But since digging diamonds on a large scale is virtually impossible for individual diamond rushers, small claim holders merged into larger ones to either get more land or so mine could buy, rent, and share the tools they needed to dig diamonds out the ground and pump water out of their mines. And one water pump renter, Cecil Rhodes, thought to himself, well, someone ought to seize all the material wealth of South Africa and it might as well be me. He used the profits he made renting water pumps to diamond miners to buy out small mining operations and merge operations he owned with others until his company owned all the diamond mines in South Africa, thus birthing the De Beers Corporation. For most people, the reason why these chunks of rock are as expensive as they are ends here. De Beers was named after the two Dutch De Beers brothers who found diamonds on their farmland and were, um, persuaded by the British government to sell the land they found diamonds on to one of their merchants. Oh, hello again, Cecil. And the lesson of the British government was one the corporation took to heart. De Beers muscled out competition, established a monopoly over diamond production, created exclusive contracts with suppliers and buyers, which made it impossible to deal with diamonds outside of De Beers, nope. artificially restricted supply, and aggressive ad campaigns linked diamonds to love meant bills 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 for De Beers Beers Beers. And De Beers absolutely did abuse their position as a monopoly. De Beers had an iron grip over supply and demand in the diamond market. They strong-armed merchants who were hoarding diamonds to sell their diamond inventories to them. When Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, left the cartel and tried to sell diamonds on the open market, De Beers' response was, oh geez, would be a shame if someone were to dump all these diamonds onto the market and crash the price and force you back into the cartel on worse terms. Also, De Beers had these weird diamond auctions called sites where De Beers had the sole power to determine how many diamonds were sold and at what price. Site holders could only accept or reject boxes, they were forbidden from negotiating prices, they couldn't sell to retailers who could lower diamond prices, and site holders had to provide De Beers information about market prices and diamond inventories. Nuts! So, sounds like De Beers' monopoly power in ad campaigns is what makes diamonds so expensive, right? Right. Wrong! Wrong! Well, yes, but actually no. De Beers only control about a third of the market for diamonds by sales, down from 40% in 2014, 54% in 2007, 78% in 1990, and 90% in 1902, when Cecil died. It seems hard to believe, considering what some people have told you, but De Beers aren't the reason diamonds are so expensive, because De Beers have been losing their monopoly power for some time. Since the 1960s, mining operations in Botswana and Namibia have been joint ventures between their governments and De Beers, meaning they share proceeds from diamonds mined in their borders and have agreements letting Botswana and Namibia sell diamonds independently. BHP Billiton, an exploratory mining firm who paid me to go copper hunting in Chile, found diamonds in the Canadian Arctic in 1991, beating De Beers to the punch, and the opening of the Akati mine in 1998 took a huge chunk of diamond supply out of De Beers' control, and it only got worse from there. Angola decided to have a civil war which disrupted diamond supply chains for De Beers, and the Soviet Union decided this whole not eating thing wasn't working out, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian government started bypassing De Beers entirely by selling their diamonds through Russia's state-owned Aurosa. With the loss of the Russian diamond reserves, it became impossible for De Beers to act as a monopoly. The cartel's power was further broken when the US Department of Justice fined De Beers and General Electric $10 million for conspiring to fix prices for industrial diamonds, and a further fine of $295 million was issued in 2008 for price fixing. Further litigations happened when concerns grew about diamond-funded insurgencies in Africa, where De Beers held monopolies over mining operations and wider human rights abuses within the diamond supply chain, which culminated in Leonardo DiCaprio doing an accent, or rot an AK them against them government troop. and a UN resolution leading to the Kimberley process, which forced companies like De Beers to sell through vetted buyers to stop conflict diamonds entering diamond markets. Alternative models for distribution like RapNet have also created greater transparency within the industry, undermining De Beers' sites and breaking the monopoly's power further. Also, diamond producers are less prepared to take De Beers' shit. The Argyle mine in Australia terminated their supply relationship with De Beers in 1996, and in 2003, Belgian 
Penrith diamond dealer Spira complained to the EU that De Beers' distribution system violated EU competition laws, which the EU Commission rejected. But the Belgian Court of Appeals did agree that De Beers excluding Spira from sites was prima facie abuse of a dominant position and ordered De Beers to supply rough diamonds to Spira until Spira's appeal had worked its way through the courts. In 2006, the EU Court of Justice blocked a deal where Arosa would sell its rough diamonds to De Beers to stop De Beers increasing its control over the diamond market. And in 2009, Arosa terminated supply deals with De Beers entirely. We've also seen the rise in synthetic diamonds produced for industry hitting the market. <laughs> The truth is, De Beers haven't been the biggest producer of diamonds for years. In 2009, Aurosa became the world's largest diamond producer, and De Beers' position has only gotten weaker since then. In 2019, De Beers were only responsible for 22% of global diamond production, and the emergence of a market outside of De Beers' control has increased the bargaining power of other mining firms. But despite the diamond market growing more competitive, diamond prices have done nothing but rise. Even more fascinating, adjusted for inflation, diamonds are more expensive now, post De Beers' monopoly, than they ever were in the De Beers' monopoly era. So, if it's not monopolies, what is it? China, 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 China. The easiest answer is that China and India have helped buoy global demand for diamonds as their middle classes have grown and they start buying luxury items like diamond jewelry. Here's how China and India's income per person has grown in recent years. This is how the global share of online sales for diamonds has grown in recent years. And this is what India's rough diamond imports looked like before COVID. In fact, since losing control of the supply side of the market, De Beers have amped up their focus on sales with the aim of boosting demand within the US, Chinese, and Indian markets. Synthetic diamonds in particular have been in De Beers' crosshairs, going as far as to inscribe their diamonds to prove they were mined, not grown. When De Beers said that they were staking a claim in the synthetic diamond market with their brand Lightbox, the price of synthetic diamonds fell by 60% compared to mined stones. It's part of a wider strategy by De Beers to make consumers see lab-made diamonds as less precious than mined ones. They're not. Chemically speaking, there's virtually no difference between a lab-grown diamond and a mined one, but it's the power of marketing. Now, some people argue the longevity of De Beers' ad campaign, especially the two-month salary rule has kept diamonds in high demand and thus kept the industry profitable. But that can't fully explain why diamonds are so expensive either, because companies can't control demand through marketing the same way they could in the past. In fact, De Beers' earnings before taxes have been falling for some time now. This decline is part of a wider ongoing recession within the diamond industry caused by fewer diamond stores opening in China than expected, which meant diamonds were being oversupplied. To quote the Bain Industry Report, long-term diamond demand prospects are more contingent on the continued growth of China and India's GDP and middle classes than marketing. In other words, factors beyond company control. Besides, for the demand argument to hold any sort of water, it still depends on maintaining some sort of false scarcity. Like, demand for apples is high, but they're still cheap because they're still well supplied. High demand only causes high prices with shortfall in supply. In fact, case, the base doesn't control the supply side of the market anymore. It can't control the number of diamonds in global circulation, and it can't punish people for buying and selling diamonds from their competitors. Demand on its own can't explain why diamonds are so pricey. We need to go deeper. Mantle deep, to be precise. Kimberlite is an igneous rock that sometimes contains diamonds. Most kimberlite forms in intrusive features known as kimberlite pipes, and they start life about 150 kilometers below the Earth as basic melts, which are magmas with no quartzes or feldspars, and they're full of carbonates and waters. To super oversimplify, and now I've said that, my old lecturers can't yell at me, the temperature and pressures this far down allow carbon to crystallize into diamonds. They're brought to the surface when a kimberlitic magma is forced through a chimney. Bernoulli's principle dictates that fluids move faster faster through narrow pipes, so when the magma melt enters a chimney, it starts to accelerate, coming into contact with silica-rich rocks above it, which melt, raising the acidity of the magma moving through the chimney. As more silicates are incorporated, the saturation level of carbon dioxide dissolved in the melt progressively increases, as the solubility of carbon dioxide decreases. When the melt becomes saturated, the excess carbon dioxide forms bubbles. And because of the various ways bubbles in magma affect magma viscosity, buoyancy, and flow mechanics, which I won't go into now, the magma expands, which makes it runny which helps it move faster, which propels it upwards like a champagne cork off a bottle. It's why the best sources of kimber like the belief remnants of ancient continents. They're exceptionally thick, which increases contact with silica-rich rocks needed to propel the pipe upwards with enough force to reach the surface. Here's a map of Archean cratons. Is it cratons? 
Here's a map of Archean cratons, which are chunks of continent over 2 billion years old. Here's a map of known global kimberlite occurrences. And here's a map of all active diamond mines since 1870. What's effectively happened is that we've found all the good digging spots for diamonds. And there's not much incentive to fund new exploration. Of the 7,000 kimberlite pipes that we've excavated, about a thousand of them contain diamonds, and about 60 of those have enough diamonds to justify digging. Plus, mining diamonds isn't easy. De Beers' most recent mine, Gauchakwe, found viable kimberlitic pipes in 1998, but it only started operations in 2016. So what took so long? First there was exploration, then sampling, then evaluating, then drilling, then sampling, then a feasibility study, then asking permission from the Canadian government to dig on indigenous lands. Hey, can we expand our mining operations into indigenous lands? Hmm, I don't know, I'll have to ask. What? No, no! Why in God's name would we let you do that? Okay, so a soft yes. Then came environmental assessments, arguing with indigenous people, arguing with the Canadian government, losing a court case to the Canadian government, delaying the filing of a required environmental impact statement, arguing with the Canadian government, again, getting Aboriginal governments to sign off on the mine, draining a lake, telling indigenous groups mad at draining the lake to suck it, building a road out of ice that could hold 500 ton mining shovels, digging up kimberlite, and sifting through the hundreds of tons of ore to separate gem from junk. To quote analyst Des Killerly, the best and easiest deposits have already been found. De Beers, well, all diamond companies, have to face a tough reality. Global diamond deposits are finite. The world's largest diamond mine by volume, the Argyle Mine, closed down in 2020, and 21 million carats of diamond are expected to leave global markets by 2023. Unless new diamond reserves are found, or unless synthetic diamonds can fill the gap, most analysts predict that we'll be hitting peaked mined diamond sometime in 2005? Diamonds aren't especially rare, but the price of diamonds isn't entirely dictated by false scarcity either. In fact, it might increasingly be due to actual scarcity. Diamonds have become increasingly sensitive to global supply and demand, and the industry's optimistic and pessimistic scenarios expect rough diamond production to plateau or decline across the 2020s. By 2075, it's expected that we'll only be producing about 10 million carats of diamonds a year. At the same time, demand is outpacing supply, especially as Chinese and Indian markets grow hungrier for these delicious chunks of crystal. Carbon. According to analysts at Frost & Sullivan, the gap between global supply and demand is projected to grow to 278 million carats, and when supply can't meet demand, prices rise. So why are diamonds so expensive? Because diamonds aren't forever. <laughs> You suck, Sue! <laughs>